Hello, and a warm welcome to our webinar today, which goes out to our customers, students, interested engineers, and last but not least, to our competition. My name is Emilio Meza, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Thermal Resistance for Power Modules. Understanding how heat flows out of a power module is crucial for power design. This webinar explains how thermal resistance is derived by power module manufacturers, some techniques used for measurement, and how the values given in a data sheet can vary between module types and manufacturers. Before we get started with the presentation, some words about our webinar platform. In case of connection issues to the presentation stream or the sound, please try to reconnect using the button on the very top of your browser's window. In your browser, on the right-hand side, you see the chat window, which you can actually hide to increase the presentation window. In case you have any comments or difficulties, please let us know via the chat. All messages are private and only we can see them. If you have any questions about the content, please mark your comment as a question with the Q&A mode button. We will try to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. And the questions we do not manage to answer today will then be answered by email during the coming days. You can also send us an email to webinar at semicron.com at any time, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Finally, we will also share the slides as a PDF file at the very end of the presentation. You will see the download button just below the chat window. Your presenter today is Paul Drexich. Paul graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 2006. From 2007, to 2014, he worked as a design engineer in Simicron's Solutions Group, designing power electronics subassemblies. Paul now serves as the applications manager and is responsible for troubleshooting existing systems and ex addressing new customer designs. Enjoy the webinar. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emiliano. This presentation is divided such that the first topic is the terminology and measurement techniques that we as a module manufacturer use when talking about thermal resistance. We then move on to the concept of thermal coupling and describe the two main models for representing module level thermal resistance before we finally get into the Semicron data sheets. Definitions. Before we talk about thermal resistance, we need to define the points where temperatures are measured. Almost all Semicron modules can be classified as having a base plate, such as the Semix 3P shown here on the left, or as being base plate less, such as this mini skip size 2 here on the right. So if we start with this base plate module and look at the cross section, we have the semiconductor chip, either an IGBT or diode, and its junction temperature. The chip is mounted onto a direct bonded copper substrate consisting of a sandwich of copper, ceramic, and copper, and then is soldered to a thick copper base plate. Uh, this base plate here provides thermal spreading and is also the reference point for our case temperature, T sub C. To measure this, we need to drill a hole up through the bottom of the heat sink and make contact with the copper base plate in the area below the chip. If we drilled another hole from the bottom but stopped within two millimeters from the surface of the heat sink, we would have the heat sink or sink T sub S temperature. We then have the heat sink itself and the temperature of the coolant flowing across it, usually air or water ethylene glycol mix. We refer to this temperature of this coolant as it enters the heat sink prior to being heated as the ambient temperature, T sub A. The case for the base plate less module is the same, except there is no base plate. And without a base plate, we no longer have a case to measure. Since base plate less modules rely on the heat sink to provide thermal spreading, drilling a hole through the heat sink and trying to measure the back of the DBC substrate, in addition to possibly causing cracks when the module is mounted, would disturb the flow of heat from the chip into the heat sink. Once we've defined the points where we're measuring temperature, we can define the thermal resistance between these points. So power module manufacturers still use the linear thermal model where we make a thermal circuit representing uh, the 
junction temperature as a current source and the voltage drops, in quotes, across these thermal resistances uh, being temperature changes or temperature deltas. So we're looking at the simpler base plate less module here, and we can see that there's two thermal resistances uh, that we can define. The first is R theta junction to sink which includes the effect of the thermal grease or thermal interface material, TIM, and R theta sink to ambient, which is the thermal resistance between heat sink and the coolant. Since we don't have a case and our reference point for the data sheet thermal resistance is the heat sink, base plateless modules are sometimes called heat sink rated devices. So because this R theta junction to sink includes the effect of the thermal paste, we as the module manufacturer have used our standard paste types uh, and mounted the, the mounted this module per our mounting instructions and prepared the heat sink to our given roughness flat, flatness uh, specifications here at the surface. In this example from our Miniskip module, the thermal conductivity or lambda here given in watts per meter Kelvin, uh, is given for two paste types. This is how most manufacturers will define the paste rather than given the actual trade name for the particular paste, which I've done here so you can see. Uh, unfortunately, this thermal conductivity does not capture all of the aspects of the thermal uh, interface material's performance, such as paste thickness, carrier particle size, or surface wetting, which all factor into this final R theta value. And I've actually seen cases where the thermal interface materials with higher lambda value will result in worse thermal performance than material with a lower lambda value uh, because of uh, the differences in flow characteristics and things like that. But this lambda value here is still important to look at when uh, comparing these values between manufacturers. Looking at a base plate module, so with this copper base plate, uh, as mentioned previously, we have a case that can be measured, so we will call this a case rated module as opposed to a heat sink rated module. We then have two thermal resistances that the module manufacturer can put on the data sheet. The first is the thermal resistance from junction to case, which the module manufacturer can give as a maximum value since all of the elements affecting this are under, under the module manufacturer's control. They manufacture all of these parts here and that's all done in the factory. The second is the thermal resistance from case down to heat sink, which includes the effect of this thermal paste and also the mounting conditions, the roughness and fl uh, flatness of this, this heat sink surface. In this slide, we also show a temperature sensor over here. And in this case, there are thermal resistances between the junction and the sensor, which is denoted with this subscript R, T sub R. And there's three things to consider here. One is that if you're using this path through the temperature sensor, it does not come in parallel with this other thermal path we just defined. You either use this path in black or this path in gray. Number two is that the sensor itself is not a heat source, so it's influenced by the temperature around it. And we generally say that it's closer to the case temperature or the heat sink temperature than the actual junction temperature. That varies from module to module. Lastly, the operating mode and heat sink define has a uh, heat sink design has an impact on the sense temperature in operation. So this R theta junction to R here is not usually given in data sheets. And for a more in-depth discussion on this topic and how that can be derived, uh, please refer to application note 20-001, which is linked at the end of this presentation. At this point, we come to one of the main differences uh, for manufacturers and also for Semicron data sheets uh, for base plate or case rated modules here. Okay, and this is where T sync is actually measured. Method one here on the left is when the heat sink temperature is referenced on top of the heat sink, right next to the module, but not touching the case. Now you can imagine that this temperature on the surface could quit change quite a bit depending on the heat sink type, water or air cooled, uh, or performance of the uh, heat sink. So with an air cooled heat sink, the surface temperature of this heat sink might be a lot warmer 
than a really high performance water cooled heat sink, which uh, would efficiently evacuate heat out of the underside of the module while maintaining a low surface temperature here. So that's to say uh, the resulting thermal resistance from case to sink can then vary uh, quite a bit depending uh, on the heat sink for this method. Method two is what we've been showing in the earlier slides where the heat sink measurement point is two millimeters below the surface of the heat sink directly underneath the module and the chip in question. Uh, this results in a lower case to sink thermal resistance while increasing the effective resistance from heat sink down to ambient. While this is certainly a bit more difficult to do than method one, drilling this hole, the main reason for doing it in this way is it reduces the influence of the heat sink on the R theta case to sink uh, measurement and better represents the, me the behavior of the module itself. Semicron has used both methods. In the past for our base plate modules, such as Semix with spring pins, uh, shown in white here, uh, we've used method one. Uh, in addition to that, this method is still used for our thyristor and diode modules such as the semi-pack family. Since roughly 2015, all new IGBT modules, they happen to be in black down here, uh, use this reference point below the module. And lastly, to reiterate all base plate less modules, the mini skip I showed earlier, have always uh, used the heat sink temperature beneath the module, method two. And if you have any doubt about where this measurement point is for a particular module, please consult the technical explanations document for that particular uh, product line. Measurement methods. Measuring ambient heat sink and case temperature is typically done with a thermal couple because you can directly contact those points. But for determining the junction temperature, uh, there are a few different options. Uh, one is to glue thermal couples uh, right onto the chip. And these thermal couples glued right onto the top of the chip by the mint module manufacturer uh, as a test sample are an obvious method, but the uh, quality of this measurement depends on how well and where the thermocouples are glued. Uh, the thermocouples uh, themselves have slow response and the thermal mass of the thermocouple itself can actually prevent it from being used in transient uh, thermal resistance measurements, which aren't covered here. Thermal imaging is a much more accessible technology these days and provides fast response, but requires that we can actually see the chips, which is difficult with some modules where there's bus bars or pressure structures in the way. Additionally, the silicone soft mold on the chips needs to be removed for accurate measurement, which means we can't safely operate at full voltage. A solution that covers IGBTs of all types, as well as diodes, is to use the temperature dependency of the forward drop across the device. The modules, heat sink and all, are placed in an oven and the forward voltage drop of each switch, that is an I, a functional IGBT or diode switch, is measured at a different temperature using a small current measurement. And then the resulting voltages uh, measured across those different temperatures actually gives a very nice linear response. So the way that's done is after we've established this voltage temperature correlation, we can actually proceed with uh, measuring the, the uh, thermal resistance test. But for this, this measurement method, which is actually defined by the International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, the basic idea is that a small constant measurement current is put through the device in question. In this case, it's an IGBT that's on here. And you can see this small measurement current flowing through the device constantly here. A large direct current is applied to heat the device with a predetermined power given by the on-state voltage drop of the device times the load current. And when that load current is removed, the voltage drop across the device is measured. And since we have the voltage temperature characteristic derived previously, we can determine the junction temperature immediately after that pulse. 
And when we say immediately, that measurement is usually a few hundred microseconds after the load current is removed, long enough for the carriers within the device to dissipate, but short enough that the temperature does not drop. And once that temperature difference between junction and the reference point is found, the thermal resistance can be calculated uh, by dividing that temperature uh, difference by the calculated power in each switch. Now that we've discussed the ease and accuracy of that forward voltage drop method, let's look at the major drawback and uh, consequences for module manufacturers when determining thermal resistance of the module. All switches of an IGBT power, uh, of, of high power IGBT modules are made of multiple IGBT chips uh, in parallel. And for a fixed load current, each chip will be at a different temperature as shown by these red lines here. But since we are measuring the forward voltage drop of a functional switch, which is uh, multiple devices in parallel, in this case I show three switches in parallel, what we actually are getting is an average temperature for all three chips. That's this red line here. And if we take that average junction temperature and use it with the individually measured case and sink temperatures uh, here, you see I have these black points here that measure, the, uh, represent those case and sink uh, points underneath each chip, we end up with uh, three different junction to case thermal resistances and three different case to sink thermal resistance resistances. Uh, and worse yet, the best thermal resistance, that is the lowest possible thermal resistance, uh, will be from the chip in the hottest location. So what this means is that we actually have to take uh, case and sink measurements beneath all these points, uh, as we saw here, and then also take the average values of those to derive the effective thermal resistance. And here's an example of how such measurements would be performed. Uh, what we're looking at here is the bottom of a heat sink that has been specially prepared to measure the case and heat sink temperature for each individual IGBT or diode in this half bridge module that we're showing here. And each effective switch, either a top or bottom IGB here diode, is made from three chips in parallel. So we have to measure and derive three case to sink thermal resistances for each chip here and calculate an average value. But even after calculating that average value for each effective switch, we still have one, two, three, four different case to sink thermal resistances, one for each functional switch, which now leads us into this topic of thermal coupling. So thermal coupling. The way thermal resistances we've been discussing so far relate to a single switch uh, and that, uh, uh, the, the, the thermal resistances relate to a single switch, and that's also the way we apply the losses with that direct current method shown earlier. We apply them to either a uh, single IGBT or a single diode. And so in this example here, if we apply losses to a single IGBT switch, we'll get a distribution of heat across the case that happens to flow into this non-operational switch mounted next to it. And likewise, if we were to heat that other switch, instead, we're also heating that non-operational IGBT that's next to it. So in these cases, we would calculate an individual thermal re resistance for either the IGBT, or in this case, a diode over here, operating by itself. But in actual operation, we have multiple switches in a module conducting at once both generating heat and raising the case temperatures, which in turn affects the temperatures of the switches nearby. For example, here, if we heat both the IGBT and diode chips, the junction temperature of each one will be higher than if we heated each one separately. 
That is to say, both of these chips are now thermally coupled to each other. So looking at an IGBT uh, module here, a half bridge, we found that through testing that this thermal coupling effect manifests itself most strongly in the case to sink thermal resistance. And so from now on, most of our discussion is going to focus on this value rather than the junction to case thermal resistances for each switch. You can see in this thermal module for this IGBT half bridge that we have four individual thermal resistances from junction to case and a single module level thermal resistance from case to sink in green, followed by that thermal resistance of the heat sink. Now this module level thermal res resistance correctly represents the concept of thermal coupling between all four switches in the module. But the problem is the amount of coupling depends on the loss distribution between the switches. That is to say, the thermal resistance from case to sink depends on how you're operating the module in the circuit. So for this graph on the right, we've considered five operating points that define a whole range of possible thermal resistance value, where this lowest value here is actually less than half of the maximum value over here. And these outermost points are just a single switch conducting. That is, we say they have no thermal coupling, whereas this middle point represents losses distributed amongst all four switches. That is to say, we have full uh, thermal coupling here. And that curve that we just looked at is derived for five operating points uh, for a half bridge circuit. And we show here when you would see such a loss distribution. Uh, at the top here for a brake chopper circuit or um, maybe one leg of a motor inverter operating in a stall condition, only one IGBT is doing all the work. So 100% of the IGBT losses uh, are in that top switch with no real diode losses. And then in the middle K three cases, we've moved on to various flavors of inverter operation, where we could have a grid tie inverter operating at unity power factor and pushing power out to the grid as in two, or we have the same inverter absorbing power from the grid and actively rectifying down here in, in four, or somewhere in between where maybe we're providing reactive power support, or we're just operating as a motor drive with uh, an induction machine. And then lastly, uh, is this rare case where we have just all of, all of the uh, losses in one diode, uh, perhaps in a boost converter where the input voltage is high and the IGBT is not doing much work at all. The idea here is that all possible distributions of losses within the chips lie somewhere along a curve defined by these points here. Uh, going from all of the losses being concentrated in one switch to the losses being evenly distributed amongst the switches. And so the question you should be asking yourself now is, if we have all of these different operating conditions and different thermal resistances, what are we going to end up putting on the data sheet at the end? Well, uh, a different approach than that uh, per module is to break up the case to sync thermal resistances into individual thermal resistances uh, for each switch. And so we call this the per switch method. And if we repeat the same measurements at the five operating points we saw earlier and calculate uh, the effective uh, case to sink thermal resistances, we'll get this graph uh, shown on the right here where we have a curve for the IGBTs in blue and a curve for the diodes in red with the outermost points again accurately representing the case where a single switch is conducting. The problem is because we have these individual uh, resistances for case to sink values, we're not considering thermal coupling as we discussed earlier. You could try and calculate the effective uh, individual resistances for the thermally coupled operating cases down here, two, three, and four, but you would end up with much higher values uh, than most manufacturers give on the data sheet. So these outermost points are what a typical manufacturer would put on there for these, these uh, per switch uh, 
values. Uh, so what we're saying here is you cannot apply these per switch values given out here to that thermally coupled case that we were discussing uh, in previous slides. So the workaround that a few module manufacturers will try is to derive a per module value from case to sink from those uh, per switch values that are given on the data sheet. And you can do that with this formula here. But the problem is that if we compare that calculated uh, per, uh, per module thermal resistance to the actual effective uh, per module thermal resistance that we calculated a few slides back, you can see that green line, uh, you'll find that this theoretical value that we calculate mathematically from those individual per switch values is actually lower than the lowest possible case to sink thermal resistance that we measured with the coupled case earlier. And you can see that trough of that green line uh, is, is still higher than that effective, that, uh, that calculated value in bronze here. Derivation of the values. So the next topic is how these different operating points are actually measured by the module manufacturer in, in both of these cases. And a good starting point for this is a computer simulation. And in this case, a finite element analysis can be used to apply losses to individual switches. So here in operating point one, we have just the top IGBT, which consists of three chips in parallel. Or in operating point five over here, you see we have just the top diode, which again consists of three diode chips in parallel. And from these simulated temperatures, the case to sink thermal resistance curves can be calculated. And we can either assume the uh, per module model here or the per switch model. And we can plot those here and they look very similar to what you saw earlier. And we can also verify this model with actual tests. So we're not just relying on thermal uh, simulations or computer simulations. So we can apply a direct current to individual switches, as you see here, or we could even apply uh, a direct current to switches in series, such as the two IGBTs in a half bridge module in series or the two diodes in a half bridge module in series. So uh, you saw in an earlier slide that we can apply these losses to the individual switches with that large direct current source and measure the junction temperatures with that VCE as a function of temperature method. And that's exactly what we've done for operating points one, two, four, and five. The trickier point is operating point three here, where the losses are distributed between IGBTs and diodes, uh, which as you can and imagine is a little bit difficult to do with a, a single DC source. Fortunately, applying a uh, known amount of losses to both the IGBTs and diodes simultaneously is possible using a fixed alternating current. And it turns out that a line frequency source, either you know, 50 or 60 hertz, is generally fast enough to ensure a stable measurement at the case in the sink. And though it's difficult to control the exact ratio of current between the diodes and IGBTs, it is sufficient for getting close to that generic inverter operating point number three at that bottom of that per module curve we were talking about earlier. If you wanted to go so far as to perfectly regulate the uh, ratio of losses between IGBT and diodes, you could, in theory, build an H-bridge circuit uh, with semiconductor switches, and you place your device under test as the uh, load between those uh, midpoints of those, those uh, half bridges. So those are the methods that we've used to actually take a lot of these measurements and derive these values we can now actually get to the data sheets themselves. So 
we've described these two different approaches to modeling the case to sink thermal resistance. And we've also shown that the thermal resistance varies depending on the circuit operating points over uh, a very large range you saw there. Um, the per switch model covers those values at the two endpoints of that those operating ranges. Remember, either all the switch, all the losses in the diode, or all the losses in the uh, IGBT, and that's accurate for certain DC-DC converters and also stall conditions uh, in inverters. On the other hand, the per module model is accurate for most inverter operation where we have multiple switches that are thermally coupled. And we can go so far to say uh, that a well-chosen value here will cover almost all of the middle operating points, two, three, and four shown earlier, where we say roughly 40 to 80% of the total module losses are in the IGBTs. So finally, what that means for Semicron data sheets is that we provide both the per switch and the per module uh, case to sink thermal resistances in our data sheets. So on a Semicron data sheet, we have an R theta case to sink without any subscript here that is derived per switch from these single switch measurements we talked about earlier, the nice DC source, and you're just heating an IGBT or a diode. And then we have an R theta case to sync with the subscript two here that includes the effect of thermal coupling and is derived from a combination of measurements that we just showed. Uh, computer simulations, uh, static measurements, and also alternating current measurements. Lastly, we've actually also provided in our data sheets the theoretically derived module level thermal resistance that some other module manufacturers provide. This value give, is given so that our module can easily be compared to another manufacturer's device. And if you'd like, you can actually calculate this value as shown here from the individual per switch measurements. But the point is, is that this R theta case to sync one value is only valid as a point of comparison between our data sheet and another module manufacturer's data sheet and really shouldn't be used for uh, actual thermal calculations because as we discussed earlier, it's lower than any real thermal resistance that you would measure. Now, we finally get to look at an actual data sheet and see how these values appear in practice. So if we look at the IGBT first here, just at the top, we have a junction resistant, uh, junction to case thermal resistance given as a maximum value as we described at the beginning of the presentation. And this doesn't change with either of the methods that we've described, either per switch or per module. Right below that is the per switch thermal resistance from case to sink. And you can see we've given it for the two values of thermal interface material, the first being a typical silicone-based white oxide grease like Wacker Chemi P12. And the second is for our pre-applied phase change material that we can supply uh, on the base of the module. So you either use one or the other depending on uh, what sort of thermal interface material you have on there. The diode, okay, has its own set of values for per switch as well. So IGBT switch, diode switch, same set of values, choose one depending on which thermal interface material you're using. Now, when we get down to the module level values, we first give this uh, theoretical, we'll call it an uncoupled value with that subscript one that we just described just for comparing to 
other manufacturers' data sheets, and you can see how low it is compared to the next values. Again, we don't use this for thermal calculations. Below that, these two values here are now the per module or thermally coupled value. And again, that is also given for either a uh, uh, silicone type thermal grease or a pre-applied phase change material. So this is the modern format of Semicron base plate data sheets since roughly about 2015. The heat sink temperature is then measured beneath the module as we described in the first slide of the presentation. And we actually note it here as T sink underneath module. So you know right away where that reference point is. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because prior to 2015, the data sheets didn't have the two thermal models. And uh, in the case of modules like Semix and Semitrans and things like that, they also use the heat sink temperature on the top side of the module, meaning that the effective case to sink thermal resistance that you'd see in these earlier data sheets will appear much larger. So to reiterate some key points here, the next time you pick up a data sheet, you know, if, if, if you take away nothing else from this, um, whenever you see a temperature on, on a data sheet or a temperature reference point, primarily this heat sink reference point, you should be asking where was it measured, next to the module or underneath the module. And then when looking at any thermal resistance that includes the effect of the thermal interface material, you need to make sure you're talking about similar uh, thermal interface materials. And you can roughly do this by looking at the thermal conductivity. Of particular importance when comparing the data sheet thermal resistances from case to sink is making sure you're comparing values that have been derived in a similar manner. Uh, so as we've discussed, um, the theoretical case to sink value given by a few manufacturers is okay for an initial comparison, but is not valid for actual thermal uh, calculations. And then lastly, if there's any uncertainty on Semicron data sheets, the first stop should be the technical explanations document for a given product line, such as Semix, Miniskip. And if you have any doubts or anything about that, of course, you can reach out to myself or anybody at Semicron. Uh, and you should also be looking at the date code at the bottom of the data sheet uh, to see if it's a quote unquote old data sheet, though some of that should be uh, obvious from the fact that there's only uh, one set of case to sink thermal resistance given. And so with that, I'd like to conclude this short presentation, which is actually based on an application note, uh, 1404, which covers all these topics that I just talked about and also gives a more detailed or academic discussion about the relative differences in actual percentages between some of these measurement methods. Uh, so you can build some confidence about where these values come from. And you can download those for free directly from our website or from these links in this presentation that you'll get. Uh, I'd like, again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to listen uh, to this, and especially my colleague, Dr. Arndt Vintrick, who uh, I pilfered most of this presentation from. Thank you very much for the great presentation, Paul. Um, and to the audience, I am uh, sharing the PDF version now, so you will have access to that. Um, we have received a few questions during the presentation that we will now go through. Um, if you have any further questions while we're talking about these, please go ahead and send them in. So I'll start with, um, here's one here. How do you measure modules with an integrated heat sink? I imagine this is like a skip. In the case of a module like a skip, uh, when we do our internal measurements, um, we do go through the trouble of drilling out the heat sink so we can get a sink reference point. And obviously this can be difficult if it's a water cooled one and there's tricks you can do for milling out 
slots within the heat sink and then back filling it with a conductive material. Uh, or if you're clever, you can drill between the channels and we have nice long drill bits at our facility in Hudson, New Hampshire for doing uh, uh, integrated systems with a with a um, uh, uh, air-cooled heat sink with really long fins. But uh, at the end of the day, it just comes down to where you define your reference points. So I guess turning back again to a module like the SKIP that has an integrated temperature sensor, we can do a lot of our measurements relative to the sensor. And so in that case, uh, the thermal resistances that you see will be referenced rather than junction to sink or uh, junction uh, rather than junction to sync will be referenced from junction to sensor. So uh, you, you can apply some of these methods or you can use an integrated temperature sensor within the module and just change your reference point. Okay. And um, this was one, I think it was during the introduction about um, thermal coupling. So it may be more of a clarification question. Um, and it says, why would the chip and diode conduct at the same time? When is it practical to have full coupling so when we say when we say full coupling there uh we have to remember that the you know even though the the, the uh the currents that are flowing in those uh individual devices like the igbt or the diode um are not practically speaking instantaneously flowing at the same time right like uh, uh, in the case, let's go back to our um, uh, let's go back to our theoretical half bridge here. You know, we we know that uh, in theory you cannot have a current flowing up through these diodes and then down through these IGBTs simultaneously from an electrical perspective, but from a thermal perspective, because there's some you know a, a thermal impedance there and some uh, a mass within the device the heat is what's occurring simultaneously. So that, that's a very good point there is that we're not actually talking about uh, uh, currents uh, flowing simultaneously in all the devices. We're talking about heat occurring simultaneously within the devices and affecting the device next to it. That's a good question. <laughs> good question. Um, here's one about semi-cell. So, in semi-cell, when using a chip with 175 degree junction temperature, it's recommended to use below 150 degrees. So this 25 degrees of margin, is it uh, considered for the thermal coupling? Uh, uh, yes, but the, the, the reason that we have that margin, and some of this is covered in the slides I did in the previous uh, presentation for um, uh, how to read an IGBT data sheet. The, uh, the reason that that margin is in there is really de derived from the measurement method that we show here. The reason we give that 25 degree margin is, as you can see uh, in this measurement method, right, where we're, we're doing, we're measuring the voltage drop across three switches in parallel. Um, because we're measuring a voltage, we're getting an average uh, the voltage has to be the same across all these chips. What we're effectively getting is an average junction temperature across there. And it's possible, well, it's, it's, it's always the case that one chip is going to be warmer than the others. And to account for that difference between our, our measured value and the actual value that's occurring on an individual chip, we need to have some margin there. So that so, so the basic answer to your question is yes, but the reason that 25 degrees C is, is, is given, and not just by Semicron, but, but, but all manufacturers, because most manufacturers are measuring, most if not all manufacturers are, are, are deriving their, their junction temperature this way. The reason that's given is to account for that on there, that if you calculate uh, uh, 150 degree C average temperature here, or you measure rather 150 degrees C average temperature here, it's possible that one of those chips could be warmer and we need that to make sure that an individual chip does not exceed the 175 degree C limit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's one that's pretty straight to the point and I like it. What value should be used to calculate power loss of the module? <laughs> 
Short answer is it depends on how you're operating the device. So uh, in the case, so what, what we say then is for, let's say, most operating conditions, and uh, uh, this is also the way SemiCell works for a lot of stuff too, is for most operating conditions, it ends up being this uh, R theta case to sync module, this, this per module value, because uh, the value that we choose in here covers most operating points that you would see um, uh, in, in inverter operation. And I keep saying inverter operation because that's where the vast majority of these modules get used. Uh, it's only in the case of uh, certain rare conditions like, um, I don't even want to say rare, but let's just say certain conditions like stall operation uh, in a uh, motor drive or uh, certain DC-DC operating conditions where you would need to use these outermost values. Because you have to consider that even in a uh, boost converter, uh, uh, or buck converter where you're circulating current through uh, the diode, you, you do have some losses distributed at least in two of the switches in here. So uh, my short answer is that uh, most of the time you will end up using the per module or thermally coupled uh, thermal resistance because it's a value that's in here. And it's only in these uh, 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 more extreme cases where you're really pushing losses into an individual switch that you need to consider a higher uh, case to sink thermal resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's here's a question I'll say about silicon carbide. So changing it up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So we've we've talked about silicon, the IGBT plus the diode modules. Um, so the question is, how do you treat the body diode losses? In the case of um, in the case of a uh, MOSFET, uh, the junction ends up being the same for uh, the MOSFET or the body diode. That is, that they physically, uh, back to our first, and they're physically uh, the same chip. So you end up having the same junction to sync thermal resistance when. Uh, you're considering the MOSFET or the body diode. But it, again, that's that's the case for where we just have uh, a single MOSFET chip and there's no separate, you know, separate device. So as you can imagine, if there's one chip, there's really only one junction uh, that we can measure. We don't discern between the the PN junction in there and the, the, the MOSFET junction. Okay. Um... And so then going further, um, when you're um, looking at the chips for measurements, how do you consider or do you consider the heat flow in or out of the terminals and bus bars? The short answer is that we don't. So uh, undoubtedly there is some heat flow, but in most high power converters, it's, it's inconsequential compared with the amount of heat flowing out of, out of here. Um, and that, that's that's certainly the way it's been for many many years, and you know that's just the way the these um, uh, linear ther thermal models are made. Is that the assumption is that uh, the the heat is flowing uh, out through the base of the device? Okay. Um, and then here is one. Um, basically, it's, it's asking for the influence of the thermal resistance on the current rating of the module. Right. So, so the current rating of the module, that is, you know, um, for example, if this is a Semex 603 module, it's 600 amps nominal current. That, that current rating for the module is defined by the nominal current rating of the individual chips in the module which comes from the mod, the, the chip manufacturer. So, um, you know, S Semicron, we make our diodes and uh, when the unpackaged diode is, is uh, 
derived based on its area and everything is given a chip rating, a, a temperature or a, a current rating rather. So you'd have a 75 amp uh, diode chip and that's for an unpackaged chip based on the area and calculations where the junction temperature is presumed to be uh, a certain point. And it's uh, really not a, it's really not tied directly to the case to sink thermal resistance or anything that we've been talking about there. It's the module level current ratings are given per um, semiconductor chip. So if we have two quote unquote 75 amp die in parallel, it's a 150 amp uh, module. So the short answer is that it's not, not directly related because you know, when Semicron manufactures a module, we'll put a number of chips uh, of a certain quote unquote current rating in parallel to achieve a certain module rating. And then we derive the, uh, we, we, we measure the actual junction to case or junction to sink thermal resistances for the package die. So, you know, I guess if you look at it a different way, it's quite possible that a module manufacturer could get less current out of a chip than than the chip manufacturer theoretically calculated by doing a poor job packaging it right mm -hmm. so um i guess i i'd be cautious trying to correlate the two of those because at the end of the day um what matters is how, how the device has been packaged and and we actually measure those values we're not relying on a a, a theoretical value from from the chip manufacturer Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're kind of independent from each other. Um, okay, there's a couple questions that came up about silicon carbide, so I'll go ahead and switch sure. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so is is the I'll, I'll start with this. Do we have similar information on the data sheets for MOSFETs and silicon carbide as well? Is what we're seeing here. Uh, yes. So everything I've described thus far in theory applies to uh, IGBT or MOSFET modules, silicon, silicon carbide. The, the, the principles are the same. Um, it may be in the case of uh, Semicron data sheets, if with our silicon carbide devices, because they're, they're newer, you may not have uh, as many values on there. So if it's a brand new module, perhaps we haven't gone through and put on um, other these these other values with um, uh, 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 pre-applied different pre-applied thermal interface materials. Also, many of our uh, silicon carbide devices are base plate less modules, like the mini skip or the semi top, meaning that um, the uh, 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 you won't see these uh, two models. For the uh, base plate less modules, you only have this this uh, per these per switch values given here. Uh, and then, I guess the only other part worth mentioning is silicon carbide chips are generally smaller in square area than uh, silicon IGBTs, so the thermal resistances can be uh, considerably different if you're comparing the two. But theoretically, theoretically, everything we've talked about would apply to a, a silicon carbide device. Okay. And so then following up on that for silicon carbide, um, the pulse test, uh, the, the pulse pattern in order to measure the thermal resistance of devices, mm -hmm. is that exactly the same from silicon to silicon carbide or are there differences? I can't, I, I guess I can't say, I mean, the, the, the principle here is, is the same that uh, MOSFETs, uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs as well have a um, correlation between their on state voltage and the uh, 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 resulting junction temperature. So you can derive such a curve. Um, I, I can't say that, of course, the curves have the exact same characteristic and uh, or that the exact, you know, maybe the measurement current is, is, is different, but um, the, the, the general method or philosophy is the same, is that you, you apply a measurement current and you apply a high pulse current and you can, you can correlate that resulting uh, uh, voltage drop to the temperature. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Then. We might run out of time for questions today. Though. Oh, no, this is great. I'm... <laughs> um, so there's there's one here about um, looking at the 0.8 watts per millikelvin um, and saying that's relatively low thermal conductivity um, and asking, you know, have we ever tried something higher, like four watts per millikelvin? Oh, so for the... Um... So let me find the data sheet to make sure that okay yeah so so uh, what we're what he's referring to here, he or she is referring to is the um, thermal conductivity of the paste so this is the bulk ther- thermal conductivity of the material that's in between b- between the 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 module and the heat sink and for Wacker Chemi P twelve which is Semicron's go-to silicone-based uh, thermal paste, that lambda, the thermal bulk thermal conductivity of that material happens to be 0.8. Actually, I think it's 0.81. And that's just been the standard we've used for many, many years. And in North America, you might equate that to like Dow Corning 340. But any of those white uh, oxide-filled thermal greases would fall under this category. And so we use that as a fair reference point because it wasn't super exotic and most people could get a similar paste and that's what most manufacturers were using. In recent years, particularly since we've started pre-applying thermal paste, we have a higher performance material that has a higher uh, bulk thermal conductivity of 2.5 watts per, uh, uh, per, per meter Kelvin. And that, you can see here, uh, results in a, a lower thermal resistance. So to answer the question, yes, yes, we do use higher materials, but as a manufacturer, it, we got to be careful not to put something too exotic on our data sheet here that, you know, can't, can't be purchased by most people or that, you know, is really expensive or, you know, otherwise unrealistic. So the main reason is just that's given for comparison. Um, Certainly you can get materials with higher bulk thermal conductivities. Uh, Some people use um, uh, different types of pads. Uh, uh, There's what carbon, carbon film or, um, you know, there's, there's different materials that you can use that can give very high bulk thermal conductivities. Uh, my only caution with some of those is that they don't always result in a better thermal resistance because once you try to squash a material between a module and a heat sink, you may na- not get the, um, you know, filling in the voids and stuff that you would with a nice uh, thermal paste like this that has a good uh, uh, ratio of big particles and small particles and flows pretty well. So, mm-hmm. okay. Um... Just a couple more before I'll stop here. Um, can you explain um, how the most heated switch has the lowest thermal resistance? Most heated switch has the lowest thermal resistance here that um, because you're using the average temperature here and the case temperature you're measuring is uh, higher here, this this little black dot, uh, that temperature difference is smaller than say this value here. So th- these green lines represent delta, uh, which is the top of this fraction here, junction minus K. So um, that, that value there, um, result, if we divide that really small delta by the losses dissipated in the switch, um, we get a smaller thermal resistance there. So it's it's a um, you're, you're measuring the hottest chip and you're thinking you're getting the worst case, but paradoxically you're actually measuring the, the smallest thermal resistance because they're all seeing the same losses, uh, but the delta the delta here is smaller than than over here. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to cap that for the questions for the time being, because we're reaching the next hour. Um, Thank you very much, Paul, for the great presentation. Um, And to the audience, thank you very much for joining the webinar today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and you could take away a lot of useful information.
uh, please join us for future webinars. And if you have any recommendations, uh, I think this was actually one of the recommendations from last time. Uh, always let us know. We're happy to look at look at these uh, a little bit further. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.